Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During the Cenozoic, the island continent of South America was home to a fascinating array of endemic animals, ranging from flightless carnivorous birds, large terrestrial notasusians, and predatory metatherians. However, one of the most iconic and successful groups of native South American animals were the so-called meridiungulates, a ragtag and highly diverse assemblage of herbivorous placental mammals, ranging from tiny basal forms that resembled rabbits and guinea pigs to massive, heavy-set rhino or llama-like animals. It has long been unclear as to how these various lineages were related both to each other and to placentals on the other continents. The earliest forms first appeared during the early Paleocene and persisted right up to the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary roughly 11,000 years ago, with some species even moving northwards during the Great American Interchange. Analyses carried out on preserved collagen samples obtained from the most recent forms, Toxodon and Macrochenia, demonstrate that at least these animals and their relatives were true ungulates, closely related to Perissodactyls. However, the relationships of other meridiungulate groups still remain unresolved, which certainly remains the case for the subject of this video, the Astrapatheas. Representing one of the five major South American ungulate lineages, these herbivores are best known for the youngest and most derived genera, which tend to be massive, robust browsers with ever-growing tusks and short trunks, superficially resembling bizarre hybrids of tapirs and proboscideans. These so-called lightning beasts were the largest South American ungulates and appear to have inhabited humid, swampy forest habitats. The proportions of their limbs suggest that at least some astrapatheas were good swimmers, perhaps retreating into rivers and lakes when threatened by predators. The earliest members of the clade first appear in the fossil record during the late Paleocene, roughly 59 million years ago, with potentially the most basal form being the genus Eoastrapostylops. Native to Argentina, this animal was tiny in comparison to its massive later relatives, with a short rounded skull measuring just 9 centimeters long. When alive, Eoastrapostylops was about the size of a house cat, and lacked many of the highly specialised anatomical traits of more derived astrapatheas, including the retracted nasal bones indicative of a short trunk. The canine teeth, while well developed, were still short and were not yet tusk-like. Given that its molars were low-crowned, it can be inferred that this genus was a generalised, low-browsing herbivore. The more derived and long-lived genus Trigonostylops also first appeared during the late Paleocene of southern Argentina. About the size of a sheep, this animal possessed a more elongated snout equipped with large, fang-like upper canines. Although most of its postcranial skeleton remains poorly known, Trigonostylops is probably fairly robust, with a non-cursorial, somewhat bear-like build. It is possible that this genus was not a devoted herbivore, with its unspecialised teeth potentially indicating an omnivorous diet. Remains of Trigonostylops have also been found from early Eocene age deposits on Seymour Island, Antarctica, which would have been covered by cool temperate forests at this time. The most derived family of Astrapatheas, the Astrapatherids themselves, first appeared during the Middle Eocene about 48 million years ago, with the oldest known genus being Astraponotus. Unlike most members of the family, Astraponotus was equipped with an unusually high, short and narrow skull. The nasal bones were quite withdrawn, which suggests the presence of either a short proboscis or a flexible upper lip like that of modern rhinos. The canines were still fang-like and quite short when compared to those of its later relatives. In life, the genus would have strongly resembled a tapir, both in terms of appearance, size and ecological niche. The genus Antarctodon was similar and was, unsurprisingly, native to Seymour Island, Antarctica, during the second half of the Eocene. Among the more derived astrapatheas, there was a greater tendency towards increased size and body mass, with the upper and lower canines developing into sharp, ever-growing tusks. Combined with a more prominent proboscis, these canines were utilised to slice through vegetation, as well as for sexual display. The upper tusks of males were often noticeably longer than those of females, and were probably used as weapons in intraspecific combat. Although I imagine that as in modern elephants, they could easily be turned on potential predators as well. 
These traits are well displayed in the type genus Astrapotherium, which was native to Argentina and Chile from the late Oligocene to the middle Miocene. About the size of a cow and weighing up to a ton, this animal possessed surprisingly small stout feet and rather weak hind limbs, perhaps indicating that it may have spent a good deal of time in lowland forest ecosystems. It has sometimes been assumed that Astrapotherium and relatives were semi-aquatic specialists, although there is not much anatomical evidence to back this up. The heavily worn nature of their tusks does at least indicate these animals fed on land, stripping bark from trees, pulling down branches and rooting around in the soil. The derived subfamily Uruguaytherianae would take all of the aforementioned adaptations to an extreme level, being the most massive terrestrial animals in South America before the arrival of Proboscideans during the Great American Interchange. Speaking of which, the Colombian genus Gran Astrapotherium was the most elephant-like of all Astrapotheres. Dwelling in the lush, swampy, forested environment during the Middle Miocene, between 13 and 11 million years ago, this genus was given the species name Snorky, which sounds like a joke, but accurately captures the snorkel-like nature of its trunk, which was notably longer than any other member of its family. This was a very large browsing herbivore that weighed between 2.5 and 3.5 tons, about the size of a hippo. What's known of its skull shows that this was a short-faced species, with thicker, more projecting bony sheaths to its upper canine tusks than those of Astrapotherium. Males possessed longer, more downturned upper tusks than females, which were heavily worn in both sexes, suggesting that these animals held twigs and branches in their trunks, while stripping these of leaves by rubbing them against their tusks. Despite its large size, Gran Astrapotherium was not the most massive Astrapotheria, with that honour going to the similarly Colombian Hilarcotherium, which was first described in 2015. The older species, H. castandi, would have measured roughly 4 metres or 13 feet in length, and weighed in at up to 1,300 kilograms, comparable to a modern black rhino. This paled in comparison to a second species, Hilarcotherium mu, which was truly enormous, standing over 8 feet tall at the shoulder and weighing at least 6 tons. Given its huge proportions, as well as its native tropical ecosystem, this animal probably lived a similar lifestyle to modern African forest elephants, being a high browsing herbivore. Adults would have had little to fear from any predator, although juveniles would have been targeted by large sporacidonts and Cebecosuchians, which also seem to have preferred forested environments leaving the open plains to the terror birds. Hilarcotherium was a middle Miocene genus, which lived between 13 and 11 million years ago, being among the youngest known of all Astrapotheres. Although occasional finds have been suggested to represent forms that persisted into the late Miocene of Brazil, these have proven to be controversial and dubious. As a group, Astrapotheres appear to have died out by around 11.8 million years ago, with all of the youngest known genera being native to the more heavily forested regions of northern South America. Although the lightning beasts first appeared in the fossil record in Patagonia during the Paleocene and Eocene, the group seems to have been pushed northwards as the continent began to become more arid during the Oligocene. As large browsing herbivores, Astrapotheres were not at home on open grasslands, similar to modern animals like the Sumatran rhino or Malayan tapir. Their extinction coincides with a major faunal turnover of the continent's endemic species during the mid to late Miocene. The disappearance of the Amazon lake system, which supported vast areas of lush swamp forest, and the gradual uplift of the Andes caused major ecological changes in South America in the mid Miocene. This led to the spread of more open semi-arid savannas in the region which in turn led to the extinction of not only the Astrapotheres, but also the Cebecosuchians, many of the larger Sporacidons, and numerous smaller ungulate groups. This created something of a megafaunal void, which would come to be filled later by massive sloths and many animals of North American origin, such as Proboscideans, which possessed a passing resemblance to the sadly extinct lightning beasts. Thanks for watching everyone! In the next video I'll be covering the complex and controversial early evolution of turtles, so until then I'll see you again soon. Cheerio!